Hey, beautiful friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Robin Graham show. Today, we are going to talk about case studies. Have you thought about having a case study to showcase what you do and who you serve and the results that you achieve for people? Do you have a case study? Maybe you've never even thought about a case study, but I have to tell you, they're kind of important, especially if you want to be able to showcase what you do, who you serve, how you do it, and the results you achieve for your soulmate clients. So we're going to talk about that today. Like what is a case study? What goes into a case study? Why a case study is important and how you can craft one with, I guess, ease per se, um, and a little less stress. So I hope you'll stay tuned for the rest of the episode and really take this all in because I think it could be a pivotal point in your business if you do adopt a case study. And I want to remind you to be sure and check out the show notes because there will be additional links in the show notes to other episodes that are similar to this topic or linked to this topic as well as different resources. So be sure and, and roll over to those show notes too after you listen. Without further ado, Brittany Herzberg, welcome to the Robin Graham Show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I am happy to have you and chat with you again. Eons ago, I interviewed with you when you had a podcast with Crystal, but now you're flying solo. So tell us about your podcast. Yeah, it's called the Basic Bee Podcast, and it's meant to be funny, play on words. I love keeping things really just simplified. So we go deep on SEO storytelling, social proof, really everything that is encapsulated in a case study. And I get to dive into that on solo episodes as well as guest episodes. I'm really excited to have that out in the world. Yeah, it's it's fantastic because everything that you talk about is so needed and mm. they can be complex subjects, right? I mean, I know we talk a lot about SEO on our show and I've got the courses and masterclasses and all that stuff out there, but it's, take some time to learn it and navigate it. So I'm thrilled that first of all, we're on the same page with how important <laughs> SEO is, but second of all, that you're trying to simplify that for other people. So that's fabulous. All right. So now we know about the podcast. Will you tell the listeners a little bit about you and what brought you to this point in your journey? Sure. Yeah. So I'll try to give you the condensed version, but I a lifetime ago was a massage therapist only 2020 hit. I entered the world of online and I saw that there were webinars and email funnels and all of these things. And one of my projects that I just never had the time for while I was full-time massage therapist was to update my website. One big thing that I knew I wanted to have on the website was social proof. I wanted testimonials on there. And so I started talking to my clients. I asked them what they liked about my website, why they chose me, why they were attracted to like come and work with me got all that goodness, updated my website, discovered I was a copywriter and that this was something that wasn't just good for me, but other people would pay me to do it and, you know, stumble down the road a little bit. And I learned about SEO. And for me, especially like being a massage therapist, I didn't want a client coming in, having this laundry list of issues and feeling like they could only get one thing from me. If they came in with any kind of issue, I wanted to be able to attack it with whatever tools I had. So to me, SEO in the copywriting world was just another tool that I got to have. Fast forward a little bit more. And I woke up truly just woke up one morning from a dream. And I was like, case studies, that is how I can weave in the testimonials that I know are so important, along with some stories, along with SEO. And it can be something that can live on someone's website and help drive traffic to them. So that is how we ended up here. And now I do guest teaching about it. I have digital products. I do done for you stuff. I have a training program. So I just want to get the word out to as many people as possible. <laughs> that is fabulous. Well, let's, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about case studies. So yeah. why do we need case studies for those people they, who, who may not know? Why do we need them? They are important because of what I just said. So they can encapsulate SEO. They can have, I mean, they are, yes, living, breathing pieces of social proof because they are a story. They are showing readers and new people, possibly even people who are in your world, what can happen if they work with you. And then we do also have that storytelling, which is the oldest form of communication for humans. Like we love a good story. I grew up, I joke that I grew up with like a bunch of surrogate grandparents because mine lived in a different state. 
and old people are just the best storytellers. And I was always so jealous of the skill that they had. I've never been a great verbal storyteller, but in the world of copywriting, I was bound and determined not to be a not good written storyteller. So I've created frameworks around actually writing an engaging case study. So you get people not only to the page, but you get them to read through the page and hopefully then to convert. So case studies are pretty cool because they're not only bottom of the funnel marketing pieces, they can also fit the other parts of the funnel. So they could fit the top of the funnel where they're doing some of that attracting for you, just like SEO brings people over to your corner of the internet. If you have the keywords in there and if you have a marketing plan around this case study, it's going to work to get more people over to you. So it gets you more exposure, gets you more visibility, and hopefully seen by more of those right fit clients. By weaving in the story, you are really engaging them and you're bringing this whole journey to life that they could go on with you. And then you get to bring those results to life as well for them. Um, So I really just love case studies because they're like next level testimonials. Something that people will hear me say often is that testimonials are like a movie trailer and case studies are like the full feature length film. So they just, they allow for so much more. You get to get into the nuance and the backstory and what stuff was already there what was going on in someone's life, what really stood out and where are they at now because they got to work with you. Mm, I love it so much. So as you were, as you were talking, like I'm thinking you typically work with a client and then you get a testimonial from them, maybe Mm -hmm. in the middle of your time together, depending on what that package looks like or your offer looks like, and then, or at the end. So, but a lot of times you get one testimonial. So I'm, So when you were talking about a case study, you're weaving a story around this person and then you're including their testimonial as part of the end of the story or adding it as like bonus content within the case study. Is that right? So I'm actually weaving in. That's a great point of um, clarification because I'm actually weaving in their quotes throughout the case study. So I'm because, and we can get into this a little bit more too, if it would be helpful, but what I like to do is have an either I'm interviewing a client for my client. It gets real meta over here with all of the case study talk. <laughs> so either I'm interviewing the client or my client already has a pre recorded interview. Could be a podcast episode, could be a Facebook Live, could be something that they just have hiding on their Google Drive. But I get to hear what they've said about the entire process. Where were they stuck? What was the experience like? Where are they at now? So I get to weave in those testimonial quotes throughout the whole case study. So it really brings it to life and lends credibility to the story. Mm, Okay, I love that. Because in my brain, I was picturing like a PDF with a story and then a testimonial in a box on the bottom. So this makes total sense. Yeah, I love (laughs) that. Okay, so because we do have, I mean, hopefully everybody does have social proof on their website in the form Mm -hmm. of testimonies or Mm -hmm. weave stories through like blog posts or even for email marketing. I know I'll weave a story in about a client that they experienced X, Y, Z, and that's why this is so important or whatever. Um, or even like mindset challenges, you know, you can yeah. actually, you can use those experience experiences to show other people exactly what it's like inside working with you. So let's talk about this. So we've had other episodes on storytelling for copywriting um, and, you know, creating your personal brand and that kind of thing. But tell me a little bit more about what goes into a case study in order for it to be effective. Like what is there a, a a template, a format, something we can follow as we sit down to try to write a case study for those who maybe have never been exposed to a case study before? For sure. And you actually called out like the perfect example where you were like, my brain was thinking that it was going to be a story and then a quote, like a giant testimonial quote at the bottom. We can do case studies in any kind of different format. The thing I've seen be the most effective for me and my clients especially is using what I call my pet framework. And it's really simple. It's really easy to remember. It's super easy to follow. Like I said, I I was surrounded by older people, my surrogate grandparents, and I wanted to be a good storyteller. So I came up with this framework. And not only is it something I'm able to follow and create these really high converting, compelling case studies for my clients and myself, but I'm able to show other people how to do it too. So they've been able to do it. You'll be able to do it too if you're listening to this. So the pet framework, it starts with P, the problem. Where were they stuck before? What was the before? What help were they wanting? What support were they needing? 
what even what was going on in their life. That's some of the stuff that gets to actually bring the story to life. So where were they before they got to work with you? You can even weave in here, pro tip, how they met you and why they decided to work with you. That really is quite powerful if you have that information. If you don't, don't worry. Like, that's totally fine. So that's the problem. E is for experience or the during. What was it actually like for them to work with you? What was their favorite part of working with you? And then you can even get into, this is something I like to do for my clients, is highlighting a piece of their framework. Because maybe in this case study, maybe in this client's journey, some element really, you know, can drive a point home for you. Maybe it brings your mission to life. Maybe it, it you're able to highlight one of your values or something like that. So think through like how you can actually shine a light on part of your business that you maybe don't always feel like you can shine a light on it using this person's story through this person's story. Then the T is for transformation or the after. And this kind of has like two parts to it. So the transformation or the after, it is as general as like, what wins have they had since working with you or because they worked with you? But it's also, what are those internal transformations and the external transformations? So what I mean by that is internal, emotionally, deep down inside, in their core, how have they changed as a person? Did they go from feeling really lost to now they're really confident? Were they really like unsure about something and now they're really clear about the exact next steps they need to take? What was that emotional journey for them? And maybe there is even more than one emotional journey that took place. Then we have the external transformation. And that is usually the stuff that you can, it's easier to document. You have, my dad is a window replacement salesman. (laughs) So it's very simple, easy for him to take a picture of the house before get the new windows in, take a picture of the house after. If you're a hairstylist, you can take a picture of someone's haircut before and take a picture of it after you work your magic. You can also have things for someone like me where I might be in someone's Google Analytics or their Google search console and I can take a picture of the graph and see like, oh, the traffic spiked up. Um, They're ranking for different keywords. They have a better domain authority score. If I'm talking gibberish, just like ignore me for a minute. But (laughs) you have something that you're able to show. It's numbers, it's data, it's before and after photos. That's more of the external, something that someone else would be able to see. But I will say, if quote unquote, all you have is an internal transformation, that's the more powerful one because that's the one that really speaks to another human, (laughs) another person because they're going to resonate with those emotions and that's what's really going to bring the case study to life for them. Okay, so I just took so many notes. <laughs> and I and I have been exposed to case studies before. So and of course I'm over here geeking out when you're talking about Google Analytics and Google Console blah 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 yeah. blah. Um because I love this stuff and I love to see what patterns are taking place on the website and what people are coming in for and where they're going once they're there and what actions are they taking. So where on a website do you put this case study? Mm -hmm. This is a question I get asked a ton and I don't have a hard and fast answer for you, but I have two options. So some people will love this and some people will be like, just tell me what to do, but you can either have it as a blog page or you can have it as a web page that's hidden. So I kind of like doing both. I like offering my clients the option of both. I have some clients who have done both. I have, I believe for myself right now, I only have them hidden on web pages where they strategically, someone who's visiting my site has to strategically know where to go and click on it in order to get to it. So I could have a blog where I'm talking about, maybe I'm talking about done for you case study copywriting, just to make this very meta. (laughs) Maybe I'm talking about this in a blog and what it looks like to work with me. I could then click over to a case study where I talk about writing a case study for someone. Let me use a different example. I have a client who is a podcast producer. She hired me to write a case study for her. She has a blog. So we were able to create a blog page where it's dedicated to her talking about her client and walking someone, likely a stranger, possibly not a stranger, through this client's journey. So they really get a clear picture of what it could be like to work with her and what those results could be like for them after working with her. So either a web page, you could have it hidden. You could also have it visible. And when I say hidden, I'm just talking about that navigation bar on someone's website 
Sometimes there's a tab that says case studies and it's just one page and someone can click over to it. Sometimes it's a tab that says case studies and it's its own blog of case studies. Sometimes people have, like I said, case studies on their regular blog page. So you have options, but I really am a big fan of having it on your site. And then you could also repurpose it in other ways where it gets people back to your website. Mm, okay. So I love that. And I love the idea of having it as a, as a blog page because it's always accessible. And mm -hmm. when you build out the SEO, right, then it's always going to be there for Google to find it. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're using the right keywords and key phrases that apply to your area of expertise. For sure. Yeah. My answer always changes like how I think I want to play this on my own website. Every time I talk to someone different, I'm like, I could do this. I could do that. <laughs> you have yeah. options and it's kind of cool. But when you say hidden, that there are ways that you can actually put a page on your website and not publish it on your menu, your main menu. And right. then you have that link, but you're only sharing that link with people. Like maybe you're hyperlinking within a blog post or you're hyperlinking it from your services page to that page. So there are exactly. ways you can actually showcase that page without having it on your menu item or exactly. as an item on your menu, I should say. So um, right. I just wanted to, to clarify that for the listeners, what that meant when you're saying hidden page. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So I want to talk about when you're, when you're laying out the format. So mm -hmm. whether it's a website page or a blog, either way, you want to use headings, subheadings, keywords, key phrases, have a call to action. So when you're doing a case study, what is the format that you use? Do you actually break it out and your headings and subheadings are based on PET, your framework, or do you break it out into, you know, the, the story components within the, the case study? Yeah, I totally follow. And that's a, another really good point of clarification because you could, you could do the PET, have problem experience transformation. I typically don't because I want it to have more of that story feel. Mm -hmm. So my headings are usually, I'll say it this way. I don't think I've duplicated a single headline whether it's an H1, H2, H3. So if I'm writing a case study about Daryl, I'm going to write the case study about Daryl. It's going to be his entire journey. And the headings are all going to be relevant to his experience and his work with Leah. If I'm writing a case study about Angela and her work with Ashley, I'm going to, that's going to be her story. So none of the headlines match, which I think it just keeps in that, like I said, it keeps it in that storytelling format and it allows the reader to just keep reading down the page. So every heading is definitely, like you said, an opportunity for keywords, but it's also an opportunity to bring another part of that story to life so that the reader stays engaged and they want to continue. Like, I have to know what happens next. What's going to be the next part and twist in this story? Mm, I love it. So a case story or a case study does actually have like a story plot to it. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. why I really like leaning on that pet framework because I feel like keeping it that simple then you can have different nuances in every case study if you want to, but having that PET really helps give you like a firm, solid footing to start writing and then to have to just keep someone engaged on that page. Like, I feel like that is the way to go. And that's what's worked for me. And like I said, other people have been able to grasp it really easily and just create some powerful case studies from it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I absolutely love it. And I love anytime there's a framework to follow because it's like having a, a I don't know, I don't know, a searchlight shining on yeah. shining the answer for us, right? Um, yeah. So, so okay, Brittany, let's talk <laughs> because for those people who are think, sitting here going, keywords, key phrases, shoot. <laughs> I know I've heard Robin mention those before, but I don't know what they are and I don't want to think about them. So mm -hmm. can you share... From that SEO perspective, because it is so incredible. And especially listeners, you know, we talk a lot on the show about growing your business without social media. So if you want to build your business without having to be on social media all mm -hmm. the time or at all, for that matter, because you can do that, you can grow mm -hmm. your business, build your business without social media. But SEO becomes this mainstay, like it becomes the way that people find you. And we know that Google provides such incredible resources. So if your client is going to Google because they're ready for a solution, they'll go to social media looking for information, but they're ready for a solution. They're ready to buy when they go to Google. 
So what keywords, key phrases are your people searching for? That's always the first thing I ask, you know, what is, what is their problem? Do you know yeah. their problem? What is their pain point? What are they typing in that they need a solution for? So that's kind of a dumbed down version of mm -hmm. identifying keywords, key phrases, but I would love your perspective on that as they're building out a case study and how they actually formulate a strategy for these keywords and key phrases throughout their case studies. Yeah. And I love everything you said. And when I start with SEO, I always start with the social proof. So that is why my process starts with that interview. Again, whether I'm interviewing the person or I'm watching or listening to the recording that was done prior, I want to hear how are they describing the help that they needed? What are they what are they using to phrase that problem? Because I'm going to think of something one way, but my client is going to call it something different. Mm -hmm. And my future clients are going to be searching what that client searched for, not what I'm calling it nine times out of 10, not never, but like nine times out of 10, they're going to be searching for it in the way that that person has phrased it. So I'm going to go back to the interview. I'm going to be listening for what they're saying the problem was, what their stuck point was, what help they were looking for. I'm going to be listening also for what results they got. And from that, I'm either going to have the target keyword and it kind of is just situation dependent. I'm either going to have the target keyword or the focus keyword be related to that problem and the help that they wanted, or one of the results that they got or a couple of the results they got, depending on how it fits into the whole frame of everything. But I'm always going to start with that social proof and I'm always going to listen to how they're phrasing it. So I've listened to the interview. I've you know pulled all the quotes from them. I've got their different ways of phrasing things. And then I'm going to type that into Google. And I'm a huge fan of using the free Uber Suggest Chrome extension. Mm -hmm. And all you need to pay attention to, do not pay attention to the other two columns. Just focus on the one that says volume. It'll say V-O-L. When you, I'm giving like a super fast, but like high level overview of how I do keyword research. So you're going to type in the phrase, let's say it's um, executive coaching. I don't know. I just pulled that up of a random case study. So executive coaching, type that into Google. You're going to have that Uber suggest Chrome extension. You're going to look at the search volume. And I want you to make sure that the search volume is between zero and a thousand. And it's even better if it's between zero and a hundred, but definitely zero to a thousand. Reason being, you're going to be a big fish in a small pond that way. And you're going to be more findable. If you go over a thousand, you end up being a tiny fish in a big pond. I don't want you to get lost on page eight. I want you to be on page one. So that is one thing you're checking for. The other thing you're checking for is something called search intent. What, what that is, is basically just like you're looking at this Google search results page and saying, am I in the right room here? Did I come in the right place? Am I supposed to be in here? Does your case study kind of fit the idea that is going on with these other articles? Would it seem like the same person who's searching and wanting to find these articles, would they want to read the case study that you're going to then provide? So if those two check out, if they if the search intent is good and you're like, yes, I'm in the right room and the search volume is between zero and a thousand and you're like, this is great. You've got two check marks. You can use that keyword either as a target keyword or as a supportive keyword. And then of course, there's like different places we could plug that in. But to keep it high level, those are the things you want to check out. And you really want to have like I said, go back to that problem, go back to the result. Those are the things to your point that people are going to be searching for on Google. They want answers. They want help. They want solutions over there. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to emphasize something because I like to use the phrase voice of customer, which is basically what you're explaining when you're talking about discovering um, social proof. And for those who are, are listening to Brittany and saying, well, I don't want to have interviews with my clients or my clients aren't going to want to have an interview with somebody else then you know things that you can do to get that voice of customer is have a questionnaire. So when people are scheduling a discovery call with you or a sales call or applying to work with you, ask the questions. What is your, what is your number one pain point? What solution are you seeking? You can ask these questions. How did you find me? What did you search when you were looking for me or when you found me? Things like that. And then you can actually ask them another list of questions after you've worked with them and ask them those questions and have them type out their responses so that you can craft that case study 
without even interviewing them. You can get a lot of voice of customer in the written form as well. So anybody who is leery of interviewing or having someone else interview your clients, there are other ways that you can extrapolate that voice of customer. For sure. And I totally agree with you. And even the very first case study that I wrote, I, w- I wasn't planning on writing a case study, but she was the perfect person. And I was like, oh, okay, how did our journey go? And I just started like journaling. I just started writing out on a sheet of paper. This is how she came in. This is how she found me. She was a referral. I rem- remembered that. And then when I was looking for specific quotes from her, because I didn't have, I think I had the the inquiry form, but I don't think I had like the exit form just yet. Uh, together the the more of like the post the testimonial that we usually think of at the end of working with someone so I went back through and I looked at all of our correspondence and I was looking to see what she was saying and what positive things was she saying what was she noticing what was she really liking and I was able to weave those quotes into the case study but you're totally right you don't have to interview your client but you know having a form at the beginning and a form at the end would be a great way to capture the information that's really going to move the needle with your case study Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Brittany, now we've talked about why we need a case study, how to format a case study, how to get the information for the case study. How many case studies do you recommend we have? I find that a lot of my clients like to have three. And I, again, this is going to depend on your business. Three seems like a good number. It could shake out a few different ways. I have one client who has three different offers. And so she wanted to have a case study showcasing each way that she could work with someone. I've had someone actually have six case studies because she wants to show the different types of results that are possible by going through her program. Um, I've had, I've even had clients where I wrote two for them and then they came back a year and a half later and they wanted a couple more just because they liked showcasing these stories. But I would say have at least one, three would be even more ideal. And then you could go up to however many you want to, to share I love it. So it's not too time intensive. I mean, I think three is reasonable and you could even do Mm -hmm. them. I think you could do create one long post or one long page, or you could do them individually as well. And then showcase them as, you know, different links, different pages, different keywords, key phrases. So you can have that opportunity to bring in even more traffic to your website. So, okay. I love it. All right. Any last minute tips you have related to case studies? I do actually have a few. So you could think through the URL slug. That's another great area to use keywords that helps make it findable. And if you're like, that sounds so foreign, I don't even understand it. Don't worry. Like I have resources. I'm sure Robin has resources. Like you can, you can find help out there, but that's a key place to put keywords as well as photos. Like do not sleep on the photos. (laughs) I, I always talk about this. I had one photo on my about page back when I was focusing more on copywriting for healthcare providers. And so I said something like Brittany Herzberg, healthcare copywriter. My face took up the first two rows of the image page (laughs) of the image results page on Google. So don't like that is definitely an opportunity to be found through a different medium. So take the opportunity to retitle your images before you pull them into your case study. That would be another um, idea. And then a final thought would be with case studies, If you're familiar with how you write sales pages, the typical train of thought is you don't have a header, you don't have a footer on that page, you want someone coming in and either clicking buy or like bye-bye, like going away. So you either want them in your program or signing up for your course or whatever it may be, or you want them to say, this isn't for me and X out of that page. Well, the way I write case studies and I teach people to write case studies, I love those links and those connections because it's great for SEO. So I kind of flip it on its head and I invite you to link out where it makes sense. So let's say you do want to link out to the podcast episode where you interviewed this person. You could do that. Let's say for me, I love showcasing the case studies once they're done and live and on the internet. So I will actually link out to the case study where it's living on my client's website. So anything like that that you can do to introduce the reader to your client and introduce the reader to your program, to more of what you do and who you are in the world that really just ramps up that no like trust factor and mm-hmm. builds those three elements so much faster and then leads to conversions. Yeah, absolutely. So, and there are so many ways to use keywords and key phrases, but the images, I will link a show, um, a podcast episode. I'll link the the notes for that in this, in these show notes, because it's all about images, like the mm-hmm. whole entire 
things. So I, I go through how you can use those images and and where to put those keywords and key phrases in the back. Oh, end. good. Um, they're so powerful. They they yeah. truly are powerful. That is how I grew when I was back in the days when I was doing photography um, between my medical world and this world. And <laughs> that's how I built my business was through, yeah. you know, every image I had, what that image was and like headshot photographer or headshot four and I swear that's how I rank number one headshot photographer. It was super cool. Yeah. Um, and it, when we talk about the URL slug, I want to mention this and I will put, can put an example of this in the show notes for everyone to see too. So you can go and look at that. But so say we'll just use my, my um, podcast or my URL as an example. So for this episode, I may say how to write a case study. And so if I were to do that, I would have my URL, the HTTPS or www.therobingcram.com and then the slash, and then it would be how dash to dash write dash case dash study so that, and those dashes are important because that helps mm -hmm. Google identify the entire phrase, the entire key phrase that's there. So I just wanted to explain that real quick and I'll put an yeah. example of that in the show notes because it is actually really important for SEO. And I, I think that's a good place for us to wrap up because we just gave like them a lot of information, a lot yeah. of information. Yeah. You have a lot of homework, but take it one step at a time. And if you start nowhere else, I would say, start with what have your clients said and what of that really stands out to you? Like, oh, that person has said this and they would be a really great case study. Just make a note to yourself, even if you don't jump on this idea right now or in the next month or in the next year, that's okay. Like at some point you might want to come back to it. So just let your brain start, start wandering and you'll be surprised if there it takes you. Mm -hmm. And every time a client emails you with something incredible that has just happened in their business because of what you've done or whatever it is you do, whatever service you provide, keep track of those emails, just save them in a folder on your computer or paper, whatever you want to do, but just save them and always refer back to them because it gives you that inspiration and motivation to keep going, keep doing what you're doing. But you also have that constant reminder of the value you're putting out into the world. I really love that. I have a happy folder on my desktop and I'm constantly, I love that because I love just screenshotting whatever it is and putting it in that happy folder. And then yes, one day something will just like inspiration will strike. And if nothing else, it's like just wonderful to keep your spark going and to keep your passion alive for what you're doing and how you're helping people in the world. Yep, absolutely. And it's that voice of customer. So yeah. even for email marketing, like if somebody sends you an email, you can just repurpose that. It's so, it's just mm -hmm. so great for explaining what you do and how you do it. Brittany, thank you for being here. This was absolutely fabulous. We, we stuffed this so full in such so a short much. amount of time, but I think <laughs> There's just tremendous value here. And I really, truly appreciate that. So how can the listeners connect with you, learn more from you? Yeah, um, I've definitely got a few resources. So I'll make sure that you have them and we can talk about which ones and look for those links in the show notes. Um, I live over on Instagram. I'm in the DMs all the time. So come say hi, don't be shy. Um, I'm Brittany underscore Herzberg and I'll provide the link for that too. Don't try to spell it. Um, my website is BrittanyHerzberg.com. The podcast, of course, we mentioned is The Basic B. Um, yeah, so pretty much just type my name and I should show up and you can say hi wherever. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you. And Thank you. because she does have great SEO, she's going to pop up for you so you don't have to stress out. So I'll put the link to her, her website in the show notes as well and the correct spelling of her name. <laughs> and listeners, thank you so much for being here. I truly appreciate you, especially those of you who stay till the end, because I know sometimes our episodes get long, but there's just so much value. And I hate to not have a complete story for you to take away at the end of the show. So thank you for being here. And if you would be so kind to leave a rating and review, my heart would be so, so full, as you know, because that's how I get great guests like Brittany willing to come on the show and share their brilliance with us. So thanks so much for being here. I appreciate you and I will see you all next week.